Folks, we'll get started in a, in a couple of minutes, but I just want to give everyone a chance to uh, grab lunch, get settled in, and, and get ready. Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, I'm sure, people will continue to trickle in. But uh, so, uh, my name is Dan Sarowitz. I'm with the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes at Arizona State University. Welcome to the uh, ASU Embassy in DC. Um, and uh, but this is an event uh, actually sponsored by Issues in Science and Technology. Uh, which is a magazine that has now been around for 35 years, uh, 30 years of which the editor was Kevin Finneran, who's now happily, um, <laughs> happily, largely but not entirely disengaged, as I know there's at least several over-retired people in the audience that are working harder than they used to for much less than they used to, and Kevin is, has joined those ranks. Um, but uh, so Issues is, um, again, 35 years old. It's been a part of the uh, science and technology uh, policy scene since the 1980s when uh, Frank Press, the then president of National Academies of Sciences, uh, decided that the academies needed some way to really project um, uh, ideas and debates around uh, uh, science and technology policy um, into a broader audience than, than simply was possible through academy reports. And um, uh, Issues has been uh, a partnership uh, with universities also, starting in the late 90s with the University of Texas, Dallas, and now uh, with Arizona State University for the last six years, um, but in a dual partnership, um, starting with this uh, issue. And um, in fact, uh, I'm now editor-in-chief, but fortunately, um, have uh, uh, an ongoing, vibrant partnership with the Academy, uh, led by Bill Kearney, the director of uh, media at the Academy. So, um, so, but I want to be clear, this is an issues event. Um, and uh, for those of you who have been following, we, we try to have um, an event every quarter uh, just to make people aware of what's going on in the magazine, but also to feature one of the um, articles from, uh, one of the authors from one of our key articles 
to just, again, generate some um, uh, additional discussion, but also to continue to build, what we're trying to do is build a community uh, around science and technology policy issues, uh, an informal network that allows uh, these to get the kind of profile that they need um, and that, uh, that often is uh, not achieved in a city that has much on its mind. Um, so, uh, so one thing that I'm here to do is simply to say that if you're not familiar with the magazine, um, we have a vibrant website, but more importantly, for my purposes, since I only think about one thing now, which is, is who's reading this and why aren't more people reading it, um, uh, you can also subscribe to it. Uh, on, I believe even on your uh, relentless marketing now needs to be the central thing I think about. On your, uh, your name badge is the URL that you can get to a subscription for, um, uh, and you'll find most of the content from the latest issue uh, there right now. So, um, and there should be a few free issues in the back that you can thumb through if you like. But one of our key fee, uh, key um, articles was uh, Ken Pruitt's piece on uh, called Retrofitting Social Science for the Practical and Moral. And uh, Ken and I had been having an ongoing conversation over, and we'll introduce you to Ken soon, but over, over uh, many years, um, really on fundamental questions about um, uh, knowledge and its use and politics and policy. And uh, I asked him to, to kind of focus in on the role of social science um, in addressing uh, kind of evidentiary questions in public policy um, and how to, how to think about where we are and where we need to go there. So that's going to be the subject of, of today's panel. Um, but but uh, the, the main thought that I want to leave you with before turning things over to our distinguished moderator um, is that uh, there is a, uh, a venue for uh, an independent venue, there's an independent magazine, um, for, uh, for what we hope are extremely well-informed um, uh, but opinion articles um, about really key issues that, uh, that, that face the science technology community, the science technology policy community, and, and so on. So not only do I see everyone in the audience as a potential subscriber, I actually see everyone as a potential author. Um, and, and so if you have ideas about uh, um, science technology policy issues that you would like to see aired more broadly, please get in touch with me or get in touch with Bill. Uh, pitch us something. Um, and uh, we want to work with you to, to, to bring those ideas to life uh, um, through the pages of issues. So that being said, um, what I want to do now is uh, turn the event over to Mary Ellen O'Connell, uh, who is uh, right now the director of uh, the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education, DBAS, at the National Academy of Sciences. But maybe equally or more importantly uh, for the purposes of this event, she had a, uh, a, a long life actually um, uh, uh, walking the walk. Um, working at uh, um, Health and Human Services, uh, Housing and Urban Development in the federal government, but also in Massachusetts government, especially on issues of, of, uh, of homelessness. Um, and uh, doing what it is we want to talk about today, which is how do you bring what we uh, know through social science research and other types of research um, into the policy realm to, uh, to guide actions that can make the world a better place. Um, and that's really ultimately the subject of today's panel. So, uh, Mary Ellen, I will turn it over to you. The basic format um, is we'll, we'll hear from Ken about his article. We'll hear from, uh, from our distinguished uh, respondents. They'll talk uh, up, up among themselves, and then we will invite you to participate uh, as well um, in the last half hour of the event. So, again, thanks for coming. Thanks. Um, let me first check whether the microphone system here on the table is working, whether people in the back can hear. Great, I hear some nods. Um, thanks for that introduction, Daniel. It's hard to remember that I had a life before the Academy since I've been there almost for two decades now, so good to be reminded of that. Um, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this uh, discussion today of Ken's essay, which I think is a provocative piece that should get all, all of us thinking about what the future of social sciences is. Um, as Daniel mentioned, he's going to start with a brief five to seven minute commentary about the article. Um, and then Daniel and Jed will be providing very brief um, reactions to that. Then we're going to have a little bit of a moderated discussion with some questions that are of interest to me. Hopefully they're of interest to you too. Um, or at a minimum, we'll give you some time to think about what your questions are and finish your lunch. Um, but we do want to spend the last 25 minutes to half an hour hearing from all of you since we have a very distinguished audience as well. Um, I'm sorry that those of you on the web can't contribute questions, but we hope you enjoy the discussion. 
Um, let me first introduce the, the panelists. Um, Ken Pruitt, of course, is the article of the essay that we'll be discussing. Since 2001, he's been at Columbia University and is the Carnegie Professor of Public Affairs and Special Advisor to the President. From, he had a previous life as well. From 1998 to 2001, he served as director of the Census Bureau, where he oversaw the preparation for and execution of the Census 2000, which some have described as the largest peacetime mobilization in history, but what he prefers to call the nation's longest continuous scientific project. He recently chaired my advisory committee, the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education, or DBES. But I have to say, I think he's been in a leadership role of virtually every social science organization. Um, I actually asked him when we were talking before if there's one where he hasn't, and he, the only one he could think of was NBER. That's, of course, understandable since he's not an economist. Um, he also led the panel that produced a book that was referenced in his article called Using Science as Evidence in Public Policy. But his most recent book is What is Your Race? <clears throat> the Census and Our Flawed Effort to Classify Americans. This article, I think, comes out of a current um, thinking that he's doing as he struggles with a question that should be an easy one to answer, but I think he's finding out, and we probably will as today goes on, um, isn't. That is, what story best captures and communicates the social science contribution to society in the 21st century. We'll then hear from Jed Herman, who's Vice President for State and Federal Policy Implementation at Results for America, where he leads the organization's work to help state governments and federal agencies get better results by improving their use of data and evidence, a thought that is very much endorsed in Ken's essay. Previously, Jed was a member of the National Policy Staff for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, where he served as Director of Policy Outreach. And during the Obama administration, Jed was appointed as the Senior Advisor to the CEO at the Corporation for National and Community Service, the Federal Agency for National Service and Volunteerism. He's also served in AmeriCorps, been a New York City public school teacher, <coughs> and one of his most important roles, I might think, let's say it for teachers, and worked with USAID in Guatemala. We'll close the formal comments um, with Toby Smith, who served at the American AAU, American Association, Association, Association of American Universities. I was wondering what that middle A was, thank you, since January 2003. He's Vice President for, Public, for Policy and oversees AAU's policy projects, initiatives, and activities, including their undergraduate STEM education and PhD education initiatives. He's responsible for matters relating to science and innovation policy and broader impacts of science. Before he joined AAU in January 2003, he worked as a federal relations representative in the Washington, D.C. offices of the University of Michigan and at MIT. He began his career on Capitol Hill as a legislative assistant to Congressman Bob Traxler. So as you'll see, both Toby and Jed are well equipped to respond to the ideas in Ken's essay. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ken for some brief comments that outline the thoughts that are articulated in the essay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I won't outline all of them. I'll just focus on <clears throat> two or three things. I, I want to start by uh, actually thanking the editor. Uh, at a certain point, I said, I think you have to be a co-author. He had torn it apart so much. <laughs> and uh, helped me put it back together. Um, he thought that was a conflict of interest. Um, so I'm its my sole author. But uh, it, it's, it's, it was helpful, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, it's still not right. Um, I'm still finding weaknesses. I didn't, hadn't reread it carefully until the train this morning. I hadn't wanted to, but I felt like I should, so I did. And, um, um, and I, I, I don't want to enumerate them or even list them, or, but challenge my colleagues here to see if they find them and, um, and bring them to our attention. Um, so it, 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 it starts with an odd premise that we are attached deeply to some things in the social sciences, which I want to say too deeply attached, because they don't have the traction that you think they do. And by being attached to them, it keeps us from looking in other directions. And the two that I draw attention to is The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge, a very famous essay written in the 1930s, of course. Uh, and, um, and it works for the natural sciences. It really does work for them to say, give us money, let us do our work, and sooner or later things will emerge that we really are glad we have. We don't have to understand how they got there. We only have to understand the product. Does the iPhone work? <coughs> does the pill cure? And so forth. But, but they have actually told a powerful story that rests upon the fact 
that in retrospect, if you look back at the investment in the sciences, my gosh, it really did pay off. And it continues to pay off. Uh, and products and, and, and uh, uh, health and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a point in the, in, in, in the social sciences when they kind of, well, for one thing about the social sciences, by the way, they didn't have to be called sciences. What do you mean? Well, they didn't exist until about 1860. Uh, social thought did, social studies did, social reflection did, all kinds of things with the word social attached to them. But the, when we created, the so, created out of whole cloth the social sciences, we took that word and stuck it to them in order to see how fast they could become legitimate. <coughs> and they got legitimated very fast, but everyone presumed they were sciences. They were never fully and cannot ever be sciences in the way in which the natural sciences can be. Their findings feed back into the way in which we understand ourselves. They feed back in. They change the way we understand ourselves. And therefore, it's a, it's a, rolling, it's a rolling process. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's a nice sentence uh, here which says that in social science in contrast stands on a shifting substrate. That's courtesy of the editor. Uh, it wasn't mine. But it, it, it helps set that stage. Not only <clears throat> can we not have it when we do have a, produced a lot of good, important, deep intelligence about the society. I have a whole list of words that I use in the internet. It's uh, uh, early childhood development, moral hazard, uh, cost-effective analysis, uh, 40, 50, 80, 90, 100 words that are out there in the public domain. And we lose control of them. We don't own them. They're not ours. They become common sense. I'm going to share a recent data point to prove that. Those of you who have been in the university club ever at Chicago, and you go to something they call the living room, and you pick up their bar menu, you can order a irrational behavior, <laughs> signature cocktail, a competitive advantage, title of a signature cocktail, a moral hazard. <laughs> Moral hazard is made of Templeton rye, Campari, and Blackberry. <laughs> Go figure. But, but, but the, 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 Bob Merton said this a long time ago, uh, uh, obliteration by incorporation. We are common sense. That's one of our <laughs> huge, big contributions to the society. But if you ask the society in a systematic way uh, about these words and where they came from, and Norman Bradburn and I are working on a piece of research that's sort of trying to do some of that, you know how many people in the United States educated people with some education can really talk about the word deterrence? Four percent. And only half of them can give us a working definition of it. And yet that's one of the huge, big achievements that we gave the society. It's kept us out of an atomic war, uh, game theory, and so forth and so on. Um, so we have attached ourselves to that, but it's not, it's not going to work for us to sort of justify ourselves and tell our story. The other frame that I take on a bit is evidence-based policy. Evidence-based policy is good. We ought to have more of it. However, it's a piece of a piece of a piece. And it's very difficult to pin down. As Adam at W.T. Grant knows, and as Wendy knows uh, at COSA. Um, and um, a lot of things go into public policy, not just evidence. Policy comes out of politics. And therefore, everything that goes into politics and through the economy is there. So for us to hang a lot of our justification for ourselves on that, that terminology, I suggest is risky. So that we've got these weak things that we're, we're grappling with to try to sort of establish ourselves, raise money, prove that we're valuable, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so at some length, I, I sort of take those two things apart and say why I think they don't hold up. They're not wrong. They simply, I hope not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? You didn't give me this. OK, sorry. Uh, let me just, let me then, so I, I do that. Fine, I'm going to go on a little bit. The, the thing, the article then turns to something called the practical and the moral. And here I'll just say this much about it. Um, science is about truth and falsity. Is it right? Is it accurate? Uh, <clears throat> then the practical is about is it useful or not useful. 
And we haven't done as much work on that as I think we need to, and I explain why. Um, but then beyond that, you've got the ethics. And that's, is it right or wrong? And one of the things that social sciences have dropped over the last 40 or 50 years is any attention to the ethical choices that have to be made. And so part of what I'm holding out there as a way to go forward is we can continue to get the science right, but that's not going to be enough to justify ourselves. Uh, and we will continue to get it right. And we have to get better at, at getting the practical right, turning it into useful knowledge, just not knowledge that we take uh, get our kicks out of and have fun in our conferences and so forth, but actually has social benefits. And then finally, because we are engaged in work that necessarily has moral trade-offs, has ethical uh, 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 complications, certainly when we're dealing with climate change, certainly when we're dealing with health, certainly when we're dealing with uh, high school, uh, with inequality and all the big things we're dealing with, we're going to have to get, we're going to have to sort of build a much, much stronger capacity to do that than we have it. We're going to have to do that with a humanist, of course. But, uh, but I, I just worry that we have let that slip away from, that was not true in the 18, 1780s, all the way up to the First War. And it sort of slipped away as we got better and better at science as we sort of forgot our moral responsibilities. Great, thank you. Good. I think there are a lot of themes in this article and what Ken just said, uh, I think really resonate with both the work I've done in my career over government, uh, in and out of government, and the work that my organization Results for America does. I want to pick up on a, a few themes. Uh, one, I think, is the contributions of social science to uh, the lexicon and the way the government works. I agree that government isn't just policy, right? I've done the po it's policy and politics and management and budget and operations and all of those pieces together. Uh, but I think one of the things the government needs to do more is adopt more of this terminology and more of this uh, dedication to finding truths uh, and using knowledge in a way that's useful to produce outcomes, which is one, one of the things I loved about your article. And so just for background, <clears throat> at Results for America, we work with government at all levels to help policymakers use evidence and data to get better outcomes. And we believe that when a policymaker is making a decision, they should look at what the available evidence and data is and then make the best decision based on that. And so that doesn't always mean that there is an exact truth. That doesn't always mean that we have the best study that proves this thing undoubtedly. Uh, but it does mean that that needs to be a starting place. And so what I, I love about this article and, and Ken's thought on this is that that starting place is collaboration. And that collaboration happens in rooms like this uh, with folks like you uh, through the latest issues of, of the magazine uh, and in the halls of Congress and, and city halls across the country. So. I'm really heartened to, to see this conversation happening. Uh, it's something we work a lot on with governments and thinking about ways to increase that collaboration uh, and to bring that work into government uh, to get better outcomes and better results for taxpayer dollars and for people. Uh, but I think very happy to be in this room with you all today and with Ken and Toby and Mary Ellen to have the conversation about what that means, uh, what that can produce, and ways that we can make that happen. Great, thanks. Toby, bring us home. So let me start by thanking Ken for what's a, a very thought-provoking and I think important article. And he points out in representing the research universities, I will confirm that our universities at, at the administrator's level are thinking a lot about impact. In fact, I pointed out to Ken when I came that just this month, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, uh, led largely by the Vice Presidents for Research, have released this report on public impact research. And what it says is that our universities need to be promoting, encouraging research that has an impact. And that's not just in social sciences, it's across the board. How you get there is, I think, one of the challenges that we certainly face and are trying to address all the time. And I, I'll just pick up on a few themes um, that Ken raises in the article and some that he's just raised. Um, first of all, the, the challenge of, of the social sciences facing the notion that what our major advances in social science become common sense, I think is a real challenge. I think as somebody who spent a career on Capitol Hill, the other challenge is uh, in the hard sciences, many, many members of Congress weren't trained in the hard sciences. So it's hard for them to comment on physics or chemistry. And they just assume what the scientists come up with is the right answer. When it comes to social sciences, they all have an opinion and they all think they know the right answer. So that is an ongoing challenge. 
I would say, though, I think part of the solution there is that I found social scientists often not very good at telling their story about their impact. In fact, I find them less able sometimes to talk, the, talk about the impact of their own research uh, than I think hard scientists. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, knew that, I knew as soon as he said non-social scientists, the other sciences, um, just to be clear. Uh, so I, I think that's an issue. I think we can just raise the retrospective review. I think social scientists need to spend time tracing <coughs> where some of those terms came from. Because I'd also say most mm -hmm. Americans don't know where they think Steve Jobs created this. They don't necessarily link it back to federally funded science. So I, 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 I'm not sure I totally agree with, uh, um, with the notion that some of the other scientists don't have the same challenge. I, I do think there are some things perhaps that we've learned from the tech transfer and what has happened in that world. Um, and of course, in the, in the paper, you also talk about the fourth purpose or the fourth mission of research universities. I'd say in looking at that, many, many universities have already defined a fourth mission, and it's economic development. And what they've left out of that is social welfare. And I worry that social sciences get left out of that. And because of the way we have evolved our focus on tech transfer, which is largely around um, licenses, patents, and making money, we're leaving out the social sciences in ways that we ought not to at universities. And we have to figure out how to address that. I would say in Europe, we're seeing some changes uh, that are getting us. Uh, they talk about knowledge transfer, not tech transfer. They actually have people embedded in those offices who their focus is getting social science out for the public good. And I think we need, as universities, to start thinking broadly as, as we talk about impact, where do social sciences fit? Right. I actually like to start with uh, something related to the last point you made, because one of the, the approaches that's in Ken's article that I think tries to get at this point of engaging social sciences in the discussion is um, the example that he gives in the report of the school titled The Climate School, which is designed to do something about an issue, in this case, obviously, climate, not just study it, and if I understood correctly, by bringing uh, folks from multiple dis disciplines together to do that. You, Toby, in other contexts have mentioned a, a similar model at ASU of uh, a group that has that focus, engages with the community. Some actually consider that more science engagement, I think, than maybe fourth principle. Um, but to what extent is that kind of model generalizable, do you think? And is that something that should be pushed by AAU in, as they pursue uh, examples of impact? So what I would say is I think it's really important as we look at impact to, so the answer is um, I think you can learn things from those models, but I think you have to be very careful not to think they're generalizable. And I think one of the things our universities need to look at and the faculty within our universities is they need to look at who their audience is and what problems they're trying to solve and make sure that and I think one thing about the ASU program is, is the engagement of communities mm -hmm. and going out to communities and understanding what the really real problems are instead of assuming from the outset that you know the problems and you go and you then tell people how to solve them. The, st the, the starting point for really having an impact is listening to what people's problems are and then figuring out how you address those. So I'm a big advocate for, and I think I was talking about tech transfer, one of the things I do think is a model that's useful and what we found in getting uh, is the NSF i model, where you're having faculty and students go out and talk to potential users early on and understand the market for what their ideas may be valuable for. Because oftentimes they might go start a company or do something and, and totally get the actual application of what their invention really should be, uh, you know, what, what the market really is. I think the same is true for social scientists, that, mm -hmm. that I'm a big advocate for figuring out how to engage those communities as you do your research at the front end, and that can be very helpful. Yeah. yeah just on that, I, you know, we work with governments at all levels. I hear all the time from people in state and local governments particularly, uh, they have an interest in par partnering with academia to evaluate their programs, to learn about uh, what the latest social science research is in a particular problem they're trying to solve. But too often they have academics that come to them and have their paper in their hand or their book in their hand and they say, I want to apply this in your city or state. Well, that maybe is tangentially related to the problem they're trying to solve, but 
often not really. And so this idea of collaboration, starting with the community, starting at the table and being able to say, what's the problem we're trying to solve here and how can all of us work on that? And that may mean that the book they've written is very applicable, but it may mean another ancillary research project or it may mean one of their colleagues needs to come and, and enter that conversation. But starting, I think, with the collaborative problem defining approach before jumping to solutions uh, is a step forward or uh, a step that would be necessary to have more academic engagement in the work of practitioners in governments and in nonprofits across the country. So what role do you think government can play in ensuring that the right kinds of questions are asked, questions that are of interest to them? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we work a lot with governments, and our theory of change around doing that is that government, especially in the social science and human services space, is the spender, is the big driver. Uh, and so if you create demand from governments for uh, evaluation, data use, evidence use, uh, that has broad ripple effects across our country, both in terms of uh, academia, and you talk about uh, you know, federal investments in hard science and then the role that's played. Uh, taking a similar approach, uh, sorry, uh, in the social sciences. The harder sciences. Sorry, how about the natural sciences, is that okay? There you go. Um, I'm glad you're in the hot seat now. Yeah, exactly, we're gonna be thrown off the end of the table. Um, you know, that's, that's played big dividends, and so thinking about how to do that uh, in the social sciences as well, I, I think is really key. And so having government be a demand driver of that, uh, pushing that demand out. So that's, that can be things such as when you're granting dollars out, how are you asking people about what their level of evidence is? How do they plan to evaluate that? How are we build, continuing to build the knowledge base uh, through these types of collaboration? And so really working with government to make them be the driver of that and in the demand seat. Uh, and the supply side is also tremendously important, right? The, the work that social scientists and nonprofit managers and others do in creating that supply is important, but we believe it begins with uh, the demand side. Uh, and so that's, you know, writing policies, doing things like research agendas that allow for collaboration between uh, uh, institutions of higher learning uh, and government, um, you know, things like grant competitions or innovation competitions that allow for that kind of work. But I think a lot of that, that starts with government uh, internalizing, understanding why they need to do that work, what impacts or results they're trying to achieve from that, and then thinking about what the means are to achieve those. Right. Want to add anything to this? Um, <clears throat> yep, I'm going to go back to Toby's comment. Um, it really is critical that the universities do this, because if they don't, somebody else is going to. Hmm. And I'll give you an anecdote. Um, uh, 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 I don't know, Wendy uh, was there, uh, I don't know if you were, Dan was there, I was there, you were there, Myron was there, Norman was there. Big event uh, about two weeks ago on the impact of the social sciences and humanities. Okay? 150 of us or so having panels and all the, you know, big conversation about it. Fine. And I, I, I left it and I said, something doesn't click. And I couldn't figure out what didn't click. And I have a very close friend in, 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 social, in the uh, uh, science policy in Germany, and I met with him afterwards, and I said, you know, who paid for this? And why didn't the people who organized it be more prominent? They were very good at organizing, and they sat quietly for the most part, with the exception of only one person who was kind of moderating. Because Elsevier did. Now, that is one hell of a powerful, greedy organization <laughs> that's in it for the money. And we know it with respect to the battles we're having over open uh, journalism and so forth and so on. So here is Elsevier getting 120 or 30 of us to come and say our most blah, 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 best thing we have to say about impact and how you do it, soaking it up, not going to write a report about it. So I think we're really foolish if we think the social sciences and the natural sciences cannot be repositioned by for-profit organizations like, another one is, is, is uh, uh, McKinsey. Uh, you've all seen their very, very nicely done uh, uh, PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. And you look at what's underneath the PowerPoints and it's kind of scratching away here and there from our work. So I, I think the, the, the capacity of the, and the universities need to be there because they believe in the public good, because they are universal, they incorporate all of the knowledge, um, uh, and, and because they are educational institutes, which means they can transmit it. If, if the universities don't do it, I think we shrivel 
And I, the number of sci social scientists already in non-university positions, God bless them and God bless the country that hires them and so forth, is more than we have in our universities. They're in financial institutions, they're in museums, they're in NGOs, they're in uh, various kinds of advocacy groups and so forth and so on. And in those places, they don't worry so much about the quality and integrity of that university anymore. They worry about the world they're in, especially uh, the, the advocacy and NGO crowd and so forth and so on. Anyway, I just dropped that in here to mm. say that there's a real reason we have to do this right, and it is actually our, our, our future. Yeah, actually, one of my takeaways from the event that you mentioned that unfortunately not everybody in the room was at, um, but it was, as Ken said, about the impact of, of social sciences and humanities and had an international um, participation was that outside of the US, we don't have to make the same case that we have to make here. Social sciences are understood to be a science. And actually, governments in other countries reach out to them for impact in the way that Jed was suggesting is, is more needed here. That was my kind of biggest takeaway. I would like to, um, to, to think about how the social sciences are, of course, many sciences, right? It's not a unilithic thing. And some have argued that what we really need to do in the social sciences to have an impact is to have more common theoretical frames so that um, different disciplines aren't answering the same question in different ways. Um, to what extent do you think that that needs to be part of this, this movement, if you will, if we're successful? Uh, well, just take an example, uh, climate change. Uh, we will not make headway on climate change piece by piece by piece. Uh, it is, it is, it's, it's, the tentacles of climate change are everywhere, anywhere, including in the ethics, including in the policy, the uh, political economy, including in the ed educational system, in the migration system, and so forth and so on. So if you don't conceptualize that, with all of those tentacles uh, present, we won't pull it off. And uh, the, uh, as, as the article tries to make clear, the, the, the technological transformation of our societies right now is enormous. We know it. We're seeing it. It's got lots of problems. We know it. And we're seeing it and so forth. And along comes climate change at the same time, which is creating all kinds of other huge demands. We have a big job to do. And if we don't get our theories at a high enough level of our, not of abstraction, but of comprehension, so that you can be talking about more than one thing at a time. If, if it's just the inequality people over here and the cybersecurity people over here and the climate people over here, uh, we'll have a hard time pulling it off. And so I, I think yes, and I think we're smart enough to begin to do that. And we're beginning to do it, certainly at the boundaries of the social and the natural sciences. Um, uh, and, and not as well with the humanities, as a matter of fact, but that's, our, that's a ball we've dropped. It's not because it can't be done. And I agree with that. I think there are lots of areas. You took climate change as one. I'd take economic mobility as another, where there are so many strands of that, and many governments across the country or nonprofits across the country are trying to think about how to solve that. And research and higher education uh, have a lot to say about that and know a lot about that but it's often buried in various different frameworks and various journals in a way that's not accessible. And so being able to elevate that conversation in a way that's accessible and understandable uh, to those in government or nonprofits that are making those decisions every day, I think is really important. Of course, then again, you know, the, the social science um, funding available, right, is, is pales in comparison to the natural sciences. Um, is it reasonable to expect the social sciences to have the kind of impact that we're talking about? Are we being held to higher standard than other sciences? Or maybe a different way of asking the question is, do the other sciences, which are more richly funded, do a better job of, of this kind of social impact mandate? And are there lessons to be, to be drawn? So there's different parts of that. Each of you can feel free to answer whatever. A very long time ago, the social sciences were in trouble. And Phil Handler was president of the National Academy of Science. And, um, I, I said to him um, uh, that, um, and, and, they, and when the social science was being pushed around a little bit by the Reagan administration, the National Academy wasn't very helpful. Um, and, um, and so I said to Phil Hunter, you know, you've got to help us. And, he, uh, and I said, Phil, when, when there's a problem at the Academy, you got a really nasty little problem. You want to draw in four or five really smart people to help you think it through. Who do you, who do you call? He says, he says, <laughs> no. he says, and he just, without thinking, he said, well, um, um, uh, uh, Bob Adams mm. and um, uh, 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 oh, uh, Herb Simon. And he listed five people. They were all social scientists. Mm. And I said, is that an accident? 
He says, what do you mean? I says, you just gave me a social science crowd that you're going to need to help to get out of problems. And he didn't know what to say. I said, they think this way all day long every day. The physicists don't. The chemists don't. They don't think all day long about complicated, difficult social conditions that need attention. So the country can't make it without the social sciences, quite honestly. And that's why all this whole vocabulary we've given to the country is such a, 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 a peer review and so forth, peer pressure and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, is, is, a, is a huge contribution. And so I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about how, we ha how well we do it. How we have, and I think our relationship with the natural sciences is orders of magnitude more healthy than it was only 15, 20 yeah. years. Orders of magnitude more healthy. And, and, and the human dimensions of, which is what it's the same development people put in play a long time ago, the, the, uh, the great report that came out of the United Nations about sustainable development and so forth, said, you got to deal with the human dimensions or you can't do it right. So I think that battle's over. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we put it together uh, accurately. Just one quick more sentence on that. One of the worst things that could happen is that we become the research assistants for natural Absolutely. sciences. Absolutely. Yeah, the technology um, then, then, then it's, we, we collectively we lose. The they lost yeah. and we lose. But, but I think we can negotiate that. I'll just say, I think one area where the social scientists uh, can learn from the other sciences is I don't think the social science sciences have utilized the beneficiaries of their work well enough as third party advocates. Hmm. Uh, if you look at health and even in those areas where where behavioral research and social science research is really important, health, for example, you don't hear the patient groups going and talking about changes in behavior as beneficial. They talk about the new drug or the new hmm. diagnostic. And I think there really needs to be a lesson learned there in trying to get the people who benefited. But again, that's telling the story even to the people who benefited. But I have found that the, I already commented that, you know, in, this came from an experience of trying to go out to universities when we knew social science was going to be under pressure uh, and there were going to be suggestions that it should be cut. We tried to get impact stories from the social sciences from our campuses. And it was very frustrating because the stories that came back to us were not very good. And then I started talking to Howard Silver at the time from COSA, and I walked, you know, this sounds like there's some value in what's been done here, but I can't find it. And he'd tell me the significant impact that that research had. But the scientists themselves, when they were asked to do it, couldn't do it. And I think if you talk to people who benefited from it, you get a much stronger case and story. And I don't think the social scientists take advantage of the people who utilize their work well enough. And it's not even clear they even know, which gets to the common sense piece, that that the work there, what they utilized, was actually rooted in, in social science work. I agree that storytelling part is really important, especially when you think about <clears throat> my outfit is because I was on an event, Capitol Hill, and that's one of the few places in Washington where you still have to wear a suit and tie. <laughs> <laughs> but when you go to Congress, you've spent a lot of time there, and you talk to people there, being able to have both, here is the hard numbers and the impact, here's the evaluation we did, and I have a recipient sitting here next to me and Toby's going to tell the story about what that means. Both those pieces are very powerful. Uh, so that means being able to understand what you need to evaluate uh, and understanding what impact you're trying to achieve and then who the beneficiaries of that are. And so that complete package can be difficult to together. This is a spooky topic, really. <laughs> <laughs> Makes my ghost feel a little bit more relevant. <laughs> Can, can I actually, though, a third, uh, I want to just say, uh, to Ken's point about the relationship between social science and natural sciences, and since I've been in this business, mm -hmm. the ability to get natural scientists to speak about, to solve some of the real challenges, the need for social science to be involved has increased dramatically, and that didn't used to be the case. And that's, that's they are a set of third-party advocates that I think uh, can really help social science, oh. and, and uh, social scientists should call upon them to to jointly go up and say how these are cross-disciplinary problems. I think that's one of the real exciting opportunities that exist is, is the merging of disciplines, the fact that people start working together and, and realize there's not one discipline that's going to solve these major complex challenges that we face. Ken wants to speak to one of well, my reports so he can go again. This is a, this is a report that the uh, uh, National Academy of Science is telling the National Science Foundation how to save the social sciences. It's very well done. It was put together by Mary Ellen and her team. Um, and it, um, um, but its, it's final big recommendation is the National Science Foundation should undertake the NAS, NAS saying to NSF, 
more intensive systematic efforts to communicate the results and value of the social behavior in the economic sciences and why it supports them. And then also NSF should tell SBE to communicate better. <laughs> and so everybody's into this game. We all know we've got a problem. And, and I just want to go back to my first point. One of the things I worry about is the story we're telling is too much the uselessness of useless knowledge and the evidence-based policy story. And I just, that's my big argument in this, is it's not, gonna, it's not enough to tell the story we've got to tell. And that's why I want the natural scientists to be in the room, or when the, and finally our humanist colleagues to be in the room, because they will help us tell it differently and more intelligently. So what's the, what's the key driver to make that happen? Um, is it funding incentives, as Jed pointed out, and kind of forcing that to happen from the beginning? Is it restructured university centers that are interdisciplinary? Is it, um, what do we need it, to make it, that happen? It, it, it's, it's underway in the universities, quite honestly. And it, 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 it means publications like, like this ought to be being read by everybody. Because if you're only reading your own journal, you're not picking this up. And uh, so I would like some parts of our time not to read uh, uh, our, our, our economic or sociological or whatever journals, and not only go to meetings, which only have sociology, blah, 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 um, but which create different kinds of environments, like this one, where we're talking across these and, and sharing the same problem. That is, how do, we, how do we tell our story in an intelligent way? Um, and I think we can do that, but it, it, it requires a different mindset. Um, and I think, go back to what Toby said, um, it's very profound when, when somebody out of his world says, you know, we've got to start by asking people what it is that they can use from us. That doesn't mean we're their servants. Um, it means that if we don't get in their head what they need, we will, we will still produce good stuff relevant to it, but it won't be packaged in a way or conceptualized in a way that allows them to say, oh, I get it now about early childhood intervention. I really get what deterrence theory does. It really does save our lives, uh, and, and so forth and so on. But the fact that they don't get it, or they get it so well that they don't recognize it, is, it's got to be our failure. Mm -hmm. Only social sciences can figure this stuff out, including for the natural sciences and to a lesser extent for the humanities. Because that's we think that way, uh, 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 Phil Hammer, and that's why you call Herb Simon. Because it's a different mindset that he brings to these kinds of challenges. Toby, you're nodding. Did you want to add something to that? I think to that, I'll just give an example. I, I think at a university level, where I've seen, and one of the reasons is what will motivate universities to do this. One is there are big challenges out there. But the other is, I think for universities to continue, especially in this time, where there are questions about what are universities providing to me, particularly in people in rural areas or places where they don't have a university next door. Uh, if you look at the, the case of the University of Missouri here, they recently had some challenges. And they really needed to reconnect with people in their state. They had legislators who were running away from the university, not running towards them. And so they went on a, a, a listening tour in every a listening tour in every county of the state. And they took deans and they took academics out in those communities. And they listened to what the community problems were. They found things like opioids. And they found things that they had resources to meet. But instead of going there and saying, hey, we think you've got this problem, they went and listened first. And they managed to get their student enrollments up. They managed to prove, I think, to state legislators that they are a real important public asset. And one of the problems we have, I think, is the, particularly the public universities, is that they have value uh, to the broader state, to the nation. And I think that's where why universities are going to have to do this and work with faculty and provide the support structures that help them to engage in ways they haven't engaged in the past. Because that's going to prove that the university has much more value than just to the researchers and students who are on the campus. And I think in answer to your question, the answer is yes to all, right? Universities need to reach out and do more. Both these gentlemen have described. Governments need to welcome them to do that and understand the important role that can play in solving the problems, yep. right? Yep. I can imagine that listening to our people from government sitting alongside them right. and sort of saying, right. how are we going to cooperate and do this together? Yep. Both of us are charged with meeting the needs in our communities, particularly for public universities or for research institutions that have responsibilities yep. to their communities. And you talked about that a little bit, sort of being responsive to the community. 
uh, I think it's all that, but from, and each has their part to play, but we started by talking about collaboration and bringing those people together. So as you said, it is rooms like this that bring together different kinds of sciences and academics, but also governments and others to have that conversation. So I'm going to ask one last question, and I'm letting you know that because once we've gone through that, we're going to be turning to you. Um, and I'm going to ask each of you to give a 30-second response. So, you know, Ken has put forward the idea that if universities, research unity, universities embrace this kind of fourth purpose idea, if they do research that's specifically responsive to societal issues that the people who it's aimed to serve care about, um, that it would have the same kind of effect that academic freedom did a generation ago. That that should be the narrative of the 21st century. If we're successful, that should make a huge difference on any number of issues. But there's lots of, lots of issues and challenges in making that happen. What's the one thing that you think should be done now to advance that idea? Ken? Oh, me first? Me first. <laughs> 30 seconds. Quick, top of your head. Knowledge is on two tracks when it comes out of the research university. One track, we understand, it gets you promoted, it gets you tenure, it gets you good students, it gets you rewards, it gets you National Academy of Science, uh, uh, membership, blah, 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 blah. And then you churn it along, churn it along. And you, you go back and go back and do some more and so on. And then there's another track, which sort of in the medical complex keeps going until there's a pill to put in my mouth. Or in the engineering school keeps going until there's a gimmick. But <coughs> across the social sciences, that track sort of stops as soon as we have done it and says, this is what we know now, use it. That track has to be created for for the social sciences. And that means some kinds of skill sets which we do not today recruit into our universities and an incentive system to make them want to do that. Great. Thanks. Jed. I think incentivizing governments to understand how they can work uh, and bring that work into their operations and their policy, whether that's funding, whether that's partnerships, uh, whether that's, God forbid, hiring people into governments that are social scientists <laughs> to do that work. Apologies to all of you that work at universities and don't want to give those people up. Um, I think that's, that's, that's really key in, in creating the feedback loop and iterative process to arrive at how that collaboration happens with uh, higher education and academia and researchers. Toby. So I'm going to cheat and I'm going to give two, uh, but I agree with the others. And they I'll just say, I'll, I'll use the words <laughs> training and translators. So. Training, first of all, we need to train graduate students. And this is a challenge, given that the, the old guard is training the graduate students. How do we integrate new training in for graduate students that can help them to better talk about? And, and graduate students right now want and have a huge interest in, in helping to solve societal problems. Translators are the people who, and I, again, going back to tech transfer, that's a lot of the role of a tech transfer office, is they help sure. to the faculty to understand where the market may be, where the users may have it. And I don't think we've done a good job, and we need translators in so helping social scientists to understand the value of their work to better tell that story. Great initial steps. And I'm actually just coming up here um, so that I can see you. Um, we have a and, but so that I can see who to, who to point at. And there's somebody coming around with a, a microphone. So um, if you raise your hand, we'll go to here, and then in the purple, and then up to Myron. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jennifer Park from UE. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, excellent presentations. My question um, kind of goes back to the very beginning of the presentation today um, when uh, Ken talked about how we might um, better embrace the, the application of, of ethics in the uh, evidence that we produce for the public good. Um, and I'm, thinking about um, information that is currently be being collected for the Sustainable Development Goals, um, where a policy objective has been identified and science is better integrated than it had been in the past in producing uh, indicators and, and data to answer these questions. But ultimately, so what? When we have this information, how do we advise the public at large how to make better decisions? Um, beyond just the information itself? How do we help them evaluate their options? Um, and so I'm, I'm interested to learn how this was done in the past and how we might begin reintegrating it. Thank you. Jed, I'm thinking you might want to respond to that. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, 
the, the short answer is go I think governments and others are struggling with this, right? I agree there's the ubiquity of data uh, collected from multiple sources, particularly governments control vast troves of administrative data uh, that's been collected over a course of decades and are just now being able to surface much of that data and pull it out of antiquated mainframe systems into things like data warehouses uh, that allow them to share across levels of government uh, and between agencies and government. Uh, so there's a great ability to be able to do the types of things you're talking about to use that data for uh, purposes of good and for understanding impact and understanding areas of need. Uh, but I think they are struggling with the ethical framework on how to do that. In fact, I was with 10 leading state governments two weeks ago in a room asking this question about how can we ethically use our administrative data? What kinds of other consents do we need? So there are legal, policy, and ethical and moral ramifications to that data, which has been collected over a course of decades for various purposes. Now, obviously, the specific answer depends on the specific program, what it was collected for. But I do think there is this overall struggle in a place where, frankly, uh, this is actually not an answer to your question, but just to say maybe Ken can answer your question, which is to say maybe <laughs> academia can help us figure out what that looks like and how to be able to do that and how governments can act upon that by creating a framework to think about what are the ethical and moral implications of massive amounts of data available to us in a way they never have been before. And lots of private companies have answered that for us uh, when we pick up our iPhones and other things in a ways we may or may not like, uh, but as a public sector and as uh, universities and others that have uh, perhaps a public trust beyond a profit motive, figuring out a framework we can use to answer that question satisfactorily for ourselves and the public is really key. Uh, this is how fast I think this system is moving, uh, that the system that Jennifer just described. I'm now going around talking about the census a lot because it's census year and there's a lot to talk about. And one of the things I say and believe is the census of 2030 will look less like the census of 2020 than the census of 2020 will look like the census of 1790. That kind, we're at a point of huge transformation of how we learn about our society. And a large part of that is enormously hidden behind a, a, a firewall of commerce. Not a firewall of privacy, but a firewall we're, we're making money off of this money and, we're, and off of this and we're not going to share it with you. So we have to cut a deal somehow. Um, with, with the real purveyors of all of this knowledge, new knowledge uh, foundation, for the good of the country. Now, that's a long slog. That'll be the social science job. Mm -hmm. They'll do it. They'll have to be in it. And they have to think about the ethical trade-off. On the, on the trade-off issues, there's a, as the Census Bureau knows, there's a one-to-one -one trade-off between privacy and quality. The more quality you want, the less privacy you're going to get. The more privacy you want, the less quality you're going to get. And it's all this fight we're having about differential privacy right now. Um, but so we, but we will have to think about that and figure out what is the point at which you're going to keep things private and what the point is going to be shared in order, blah, 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 and so forth. So I, I think the, the capacity to do that has got to be a social science capacity. Uh, and it's where the social science intersect with the technologists and so forth and so on. We, it's a big mess. We know that. And without beating that dead horse, uh, it's not dead. It's the problem. It's still running. Uh, and uh, so on. Um, but the other thing I would say is, we have a huge, 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 in our research universities, uh, a captive audience, our students. If we really teach them this stuff, if we really get the, the ethical trade-offs into their heads as part of the thing they have to think about all the time, and all this new data has got to have this kind of attention instead of that kind of attention, we can spread this word very quickly. So it's a matter of rewriting our courses. Uh, and, and we've got new textbooks coming out, and we've got new things coming out all the time. And we have to really, people have got to go to work to put the curriculum together they want their students to take in into their adult lives. And that will, that will move it quickly. That includes including in, in the natural sciences ethical issues yeah. in textbooks, which is a good article in Nature, that uh, editorial in this past, I, past couple of weeks that addresses this very issue is that social issues aren't integrated into the curriculum, into the natural sciences. And they need to be. Next was in the back. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, it, 
My name is Teresa Murad. I uh, work for the Ecological Society of America, uh, so the natural sciences. Uh, and, uh, yes. and it's a bit of a coming home for me, actually, this because I actually started out as, as a student of sociology. So I managed to successfully cross the bridge, if you like. And, and it was very interesting to hear the struggles that you're facing, because I will tell you that from the uh, natural sciences uh, perspective, we are hurting and looking and wanting all the social science people out there to help us, right, to work with us. And we don't know how. Right? So some, somewhere along the way, we are not connecting. And so I, I would like to uh, suggest that we think about professional societies, think about being present, especially some of these uh, long-term uh, types of complex problems, you know, we, uh, climate change has been mentioned, uh, and all the changes in our communities have been mentioned, and even now in the ecological sphere, we have people studying changes in urban communities, for example, right? So there are many, many things that we need, uh, uh, the human dimensions, and, and we all have acknowledged in our field, you know, the age of the Anthropocene, right? So this is something that we need tremendous help. NSF has been calling for broader impacts for mm -hmm. every proposal as part of the uh, evaluation. And I, I just feel that you know, there's a lot of room for that uh, cross-disciplinary co connection. And even in our um, education framework, I would say, we, um, last November, the, our governing board, you know, after 100 years of existence, right, as a professional society, we finally have uh, a four-dimensional ecology education framework endorsed by our governing board. And guess what? One of those dimensions is human dimensions. So we have a lot to do, and we really would love to work with all of you. Thank you. Maybe it's a new uh, committee or organization for you to chair. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for that comment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Myron Strapp with Virginia Tech. Uh, as Jed mentioned, uh, the social science findings and methods are indeed ubiquitous across uh, state, local, and community governments, driven by data. Yet predictive analytics have taken them by storm. But if you look at a political setting, how do you determine an impact, much more measure it, when you're looking at the results of a political process? Because our political system is not great for solving problems. It's great for seeking a resolution to various predicaments. Well, I think uh, the event I was at this morning on Capitol Hill was about bipartisanship. It was not the hearing. Um, <laughs> so you know, I think that there are areas where there is consensus. This particular event was about uh, criminal justice reform right, and sentencing reform. I think if you look at the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is about elementary and secondary education, there are a lot of areas where there are agreement. And taking ESSA, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, as an example, there are requirements in there that evaluation and data be used in money that states are, are doing, right? So there's evaluations and impacts around that. So I don't disagree with you that our, uh, there are difficulties in our political process, especially when you get to places uh, like Congress. But I think if you look at city councils, for example, there tends to be a lot more uh, agreement on, ha on how that work can happen at a local level. Now, maybe those people have to face their constituents in the streets every day in a way that uh, people in Congress don't have to. Uh, so I do think it's a problem, but I do think we are seeing changes in impacts, maybe not at the speed uh, and depth that we'd like. Uh, but part of that is about the storytelling and how do we lift it up and tell those stories of what those impact on. And that's incumbent upon us in this room and on this panel to think about how to do that. So I, I don't. It is difficult, but I think there is progress being made. I'll just give an analogy um, because I think it gets back to the storytelling. Because I'm not—I don't—I'm not convinced you need to demonstrate quantitative information about impact, but you do need to understand the value of your own work as a social scientist. So a few years back, I was at a conference of federal government relations folks, and there was a—we had a panel on presidential elections. We had an expert from the political science department on who studied presidential elections, and we had then a writer for the LA Times who followed presidential elections. It was not long after political science and the budget had been zeroed for political science. And the, the, the political scientist started by saying, I know who you all are in the audience. You're the people who helped us get our money back, and I'm very thankful. And I spent some time, she spent some time on the Hill actually trying to make the case. So I, at the end, said, you've been up on the Hill. What kind of case did you make? on the Hill about the value of what you do. 
She said, well, I produce jobs. And I was a bit horrified because what she said was, every graduate student who works for me is a student, and we're paying them. And I said, that will not fly. Mm -hmm. um, not a good answer. What she failed to recognize is what the LA Times reporter then said. She studies presidential elections. They are essential to our democracy. She challenges what I do every day in terms of how I think about these things, what I need to consider. And he told the story much better than she did. She couldn't talk about the value of her own research. And I think that's the storytelling, that we've got to help people to recognize the value that they have. It's very hard, because it sounds like you're being pompous or you're promoting your own work, but that's what needs to happen. Hmm. Interesting. Adam. I'm Adam Gammer from the William T. Grant Foundation, and I want to make three quick points, but I can't resist answering Myron's question first. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a mistake to frame the question of impact so narrowly, and I think this is the point Ken is getting at when he says evidence-based policymaking is too narrow a frame to judge the value of the social sciences. Uh, it's naive to think that any research evidence is going to drive policy decisions. What we should be after is having evidence at the table when policy is discussed. And so evidence of impact in that sense can be gleaned from examining the mentions, references to research in policy deliberations, in the mass media, in uh, um, uh, testimony, et cetera. Um, and uh, measuring the use of research evidence is difficult, and I'll just advertise a resource to anybody who wants to see. We have a great new book called Methods for Studying the Use of Research Evidence by Drew Jatomer and Ke Kevin Krauss. It's on the website of the William T. Grant Foundation. I recommend it. OK, my three, my three quick points. Um, first, uh, the, it is true that um, tech transfer is highly valued in medicine and engineering, and it's disparaged in the social sciences. So why is that? Well, it's because money. Money follows tech transfer in engineering and medicine. <coughs> money doesn't follow the transfer of knowledge from the research laboratory to the field in the social sciences. So uh, we, in, those of us in philanthropy and those in government need to turn, need to rethink that need to rethink our contributions to research and to make it in part uh, with respect to the likelihood that it will turn into uh, usable, now, not useless knowledge, but usable knowledge. Second, second point, um, so why is it that Ken can list off 90 phrases that have come from the social sciences into everyday parlance and yet, um, Toby says it's hard to get any social scientists to talk about their impact. I think you're talking, there are two different kinds of impact being referenced here. One is the instrumental use of, of evidence where you gotta make a decision. Well, what does the research say? Okay, that's my decision. That's very rare. In fact, almost never happens. But the conceptual use of evidence, that happens all the time. So when uh, notions like uh, moral hazard get into our vocabulary, it's because Social sciences have influenced the way we think about problems, influenced our understanding of potential responses to problems. And we need to be attuned to those uses of the social science research as well. And third, uh, to amplify a point that Toby made about why would universities be willing to support the kind of changes that Ken is talking about to support social science in the public good. And it's because universities are criticized from all corners now. They're politically biased, they're hoarding money, the value of a degree is diminishing, et cetera, et cetera, mostly false narratives, but those narratives are out there. And I'm, in my conversations with university leadership, they're wildly enthusiastic about, and, and I'm sure that's where that APLU report comes out of, the idea that social sciences contribute to the public good by solving social problems, or at least providing new ways to understand, think about social problems. Uh, so the university leadership is strongly in support of it. When you get down to the disciplines, when you get down to the departments, they're still stuck on evaluating the contribution of research uh, according to whether it contributes to new research and not according to whether it contributes to solving social problems. So that's where, that's where the work needs to come in. 
I'm actually going to move to more um, the excellent comments, lots to think about. And we've got a ton of hands in about 10 minutes. So um, I'm going to go to the young woman in the second end from the, the you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my comment, I think, follows up the point that was just made. Um, I congratulate the panel. I think there's a lot more work to be done that's both disciplinary level as well as broader than just universities and government. I'm going to give you five quick points, uh, and I'd be interested in reactions. Number one, I'm a political scientist. I'm a director of evaluation at the Center for International Private Enterprise. Political science is one of the worst offenders. It believes in not advocating, only recently joined CASA. And secondly, two months ago, I attended a panel at the American Political Science Association staffed by members of an APSA task force uh, providing ideas for the Committee to Modernize Congress. The panelists themselves said, I don't know how to do reform, and we can't talk values. We can only just provide some information. That was kind of sad. Third, the two years ago, the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Commission produced its report. There was not one single recommendation for how Congress should be reformed to be able to understand and use evidence. Lots of evidence and recommendations for agencies. OTA was eliminated in the 1990s, and Congress needs more than that in terms of how to interpret and understand evidence. Uh, fourth, academic collaboration. I work in the field of international development. There are three major groups that talk about how academics can collaborate. One is 3IE, a second is JPAL, the third is the British Campbell Collaborative. They all emphasize RCTs, which is just a narrow slice of what social sciences do. And last and fifth is ethics. Ethics is more complicated than you might think. Two quick examples. A psychologist who helped with waterboarding. Our social science knowledge can be used for ill as well as for good. And secondly, um, Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, I've tracked them since the 1980s. They have used social science knowledge to elect despots all over the world. It is one thing on the on Congress's and government's capability to understand and process research. But I think there's a strong need to build capacity both in the legislative and executive branch for understanding what research is. Part of it is translating that research into ways that are understandable, but part of it also is having that capability to understand what it means. So when you talk about eliminating OTA, for example, in Congress, to be able to understand and that that's just the technology slice, right? That's not even the data and evidence slice. One of the things we did at Results for America, we put out a 2020 playbook, 17 ideas for the next administration to use evidence and data to uh, address economic mobility in our country. One of those ideas is around building capability within the federal government to do that, creating a What Works Institute uh, to help federal agencies as well as the legislative branch mm -hmm. understand uh, some of the basics of social science research and how that can be incorporated into government's work. And hiring more people into government agencies that are these bilingual uh, translators that you talked about that can both understand what the research says and understand the policy implications of that in a way that can be operationalized to actually affect policy uh, and policy, not like abstract policy, policy is in how are we going to run this specific benefit program? What does it mean on how we're going to do that? Run it ourselves, put requirements on states to do that. What are we going to require them to report to us? What are the measures we want? Does that drive the change that we want? Uh, so I think all that capability and that capacity building is, is really important to make sure it is, to your point, used for good and in a way we can understand what the impact of it is that it's being used for good and not uh, commercialized or used uh, for ill. So I skipped up here. I'm, gonna... I'm actually going to ask. We have um, less than 10 minutes, six, according to my um, watch. So I'm actually going to suggest that I saw four hands up, that each of you state your comment or question very quickly. And then um, we can choose, you know, people can kind of respond to whatever seems most relevant. Tom Lewis, Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health. I was tempted to start by thanking you for your service, but I won't, won't do that. <laughs> um, Ken, you've talked about this in the article and also in other times about professional schools being one of the places where the action may be able to hit the road, and it does hit the road. But those schools are generally thought of as kind of lesser academe, although I'm in them and don't feel that way at all. What can be done to try to elevate the reputation of what are already on the ground truth very excellent organizations and get more integration across university lines quickly at Hopkins now the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering has combined to have an arts and science department well, engineering school department and the School of Public Health that kind of thing kind of gives a hint that it can happen 
So hold your thought on that, and we're going to go to um, the gentleman with his hand up. So I'll take that back. Actually, um, a couple of weeks ago, Bob Sh Robert Schiller was talking about his narrative book, and he had a curious comment about going to visit the um, marketing department at Yale in, in, in business school at Yale and having some really great conversations. And then he said that nobody else ever goes talk, talk, talking to marketing people. And I was wondering, is this kind of a, is there a barrier between social science departments, for example, sociology departments and marketing departments? There used to be a barrier between physics departments and engineering departments. I'm wondering whether this is a similar phenomenon. Thanks, and we're gonna go to Kevin. Okay, Kevin Finneran with Issues. Um, as an editor, I have to make a language um, observation. We have physics and we get electrical engineering, we have chemistry, we get industrial engineering, we have material science, um, we get civil engineering, we have the social sciences, we get social engineering, which is not the type of association, not, not the association you want. And this brings up the question about the common sense um, notion, saying, well, often what we find this, the great contribution of the social sciences, of course, is to find what's counterintuitive. It's to find something that's true, but is, is largely misunderstood or not known by the general public. So I wonder, how do we get around the idea that what we're not talking about is the violation of common sense, but the violation of unexamined assumptions? And how do we make that case in trying to promote the social sciences? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think there's one other hand over here that I saw. No? Otherwise, we'll um, you know, give the panelists one final opportunity to respond to any of these last comments, other comments that we didn't actually respond to directly, or whatever you want to say by way of final words. Who wants to go first? Ken, you probably want the final word. <laughs> okay, I'll wait till I make this. I don't know that I have a whole lot to say on the first two questions, although I do, do believe that, again, when we think of where social science is used, it's used in marketing. It's used in a lot of places. And I think uh, that is not well recognized in, in that linkage and on our campuses. We do need to work to, to make sure. And part of the problem here, I think, is social scientists themselves don't look uh, favorably upon those other more applied um, areas of science in the, in the professional schools and what they do. Um, I, I just say, on the, uh, Kevin, to your point, I still think there's value in doing retrospective reviews and going back from common understanding what, what is thought to be well known and tracing it back to, again, theories and things that grew out of the social sciences. I just don't think they've done a good job. We spent a lot of time in the natural sciences and other sciences trying to do that. Social scientists need to spend some time doing it. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this overall conversation has been very informative. I think you mentioned the capacity piece before. Several folks, and you as well, have talked about the role of graduate schools and professional schools in doing that. I think it's important that not only those professional schools learning, for example, program evaluation and abstract, but are learning from professors of practice or uh, having to do as part of the requirement internships or other things uh, in the sectors in which they want to do that work to create that integration and that collaboration uh, they can both be influential in affecting those institutions of higher learning as well as those students themselves to build that practical knowledge and the bridges between the two uh, to create that collaboration uh, I think is really important and goes to your idea of this fourth purpose of really uh, focusing on the impact of society that has I think benefits for uh, universities, their students, communities, and governments that all share that same goal. And so I think it starts uh, in universities and it starts in government and bridges and bridges between them uh, in many of the ways we've talked about and, you just, and Ken discusses in his article. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I'll put it this way. It's not a very nice way to put it, but um, I, I think the, uh, in the, the best universities which set the tone for this conversation, of course, that is the, the two dozen or three dozen or four dozen, say the AEU schools, uh, 52, 62? 65. 65. As That's about including the Canadians, ago. right? As about including the Canadians. Canadians 63 yeah. US. Um, yeah, no, OK, say, say 60. So let's take those. Um, there is a smugness there embedded in the social sciences more than in the natural sciences and the, and the and medical sciences and, and so forth. And it is a nervous smugness. Uh, and so the only way they can, and I'm saying this pretty bluntly, but the way they, they sort of take care of that smugness is talk to themselves. 
Um, the humanists did a huge thing to themselves when they went into this uh, deconstructionism for a decade. And uh, it took them a long time to climb back, uh, which they have been climbing back. And I think we went into a period like that somewhere um, uh, after, the, uh, after the surge of big science in the 1960s and 70s, over the next two or three or four decades, we just got very confident of ourselves, even though the neoconservatives were taking apart some of the things that we were building uh, and so forth. And so I, I, I really think it's a, it's, a, it's a mindset, is I've got tenure, and, and you don't. And if you get it in the professional school, it doesn't count. I asked somebody at Stanford the other day, major economist, I said, do you think Stanford will ever open up a, a, a policy school? And he says, no, why would we want second-rate economists? <laughs> you know, after all, Chicago has them, Columbia has them, Hopkins has them, and, you know, and so forth. And so, what? <laughs> but nevertheless, Stanford is too rich. It really is. It should have less money. It should give some up to Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, right. Um, and um, so I, I think there's a really cultural problem, and I think we have to use this, whether the fourth purpose or some other vocabulary, or let's, let's get a little sense of what people think we can give to them, or whatever the vocabulary would be, um, to, to break the hold of that. And I think it's going to have to start, it's not going to, it's not going to come out of the leadership. Uh, the elite, the most important social science. It's not going to come out of it. It will come out of institutions. It will come out of research. It will come out of our courses and so forth and so on. Uh, and it's the same thing with marketing. You know, of course, of course marketing came out of social science. We, Lashes felt to call it a two-step flow. You know, and we conceptualized how stuff moves in the society and so forth, the whole marketing industry. And we do, we, one, we get no credit for it, and it's, two, we sort of brush it aside. Like, you know, why? We're trying to market ourselves. We don't want to use the word, and we do have to. And so I guess the, well, just quickly on the self-engineering, on the social engineering thing, that is a serious problem. That is our own vocabulary. We don't want to say social engineering. We don't want to say socialism. We don't even want to say social work. We have a vocabulary problem for which I don't have an easy answer, or any answer. Um, but we are social scientists. We know how to think about words. <laughs> and we know how to think about putting words into it. If, if we can't think of it, then who in the hell is going to do it for us? Um, we did not study how we do our own work. Bob Merton said in 1949, what we really need is a serious body of research on who we are, how we behave, how we don't behave, and so forth. That was 1949, and it never happened, and it has not yet happened. So I want to be self-reflective about this. I guess the biggest thing I would say is we've got to put it into the curriculum. Uh, wherever these are, spots are where, where there's rationality uh, descending, uh, and so forth. And so I don't mean rational man models. I mean uh, different kind of rationality. Um, uh, wherever it is, I think we've got to put it into our curriculum. And, 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 and as they graduate and they get, and get PhDs, and, so forth, and they'll carry it out. I don't think we can sort of sit here in a room someday and say, here are the nine things we should start doing. If our research universities don't do it, it won't happen, uh, for the reasons I already said. So anyway, the, 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 the you can feel the movement. Uh, you, 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 there's what you just said about the land grant. But it's all over. It's the, it's, everybody has got some aspect of this vocabulary in their head now. And, and so some of it's going to gel. Some of it will fade. Um, and so I think whenever you got a chance, whatever little part of the world you're in, whether it's in the government or in an NGO <laughs> or whatever, is where you see that little spark, uh, you know, light it, push it. Um, uh, I don't think there's going to be a big thing that will sort of solve this problem. But, uh, but I, I, I do think that the wind's behind our back on, on making something happen. Great. So I started by, um, by saying that Ken's essay was provocative. I think that proved to be true in this discussion as well, including from many of the, um, the comments and questions that were asked. We clearly didn't get a chance to dive into many of the other good ideas that came out um, in the course of comments. I think that's an indication to me of this is, should be a first discussion. Um, it shouldn't end when everybody leaves here, as Ken indicated, but um, need to figure out what the next steps are to um, explore these ideas further, both those in his essay and those that were um, raised during the discussion. Um, so I think we run out of time. Before turning it over to Daniel, though, I just want to thank all the panelists for their time and thank all of you for coming.
Uh, thanks. So please indulge me for one minute. Three, three quick things. Um, the first is we'll do this again um, in January for the next issue of Issues, where we will uh, have an article on the uh, power of publishers in influencing scientific agendas. We will have an article on how to think about intellectual property for creations made by machines. Uh, we will have uh, an article on whether or not personalized medicine is actually a path to um, population-wide health. Uh, among many other things. So, um, uh, so we hope to see you again. Uh, we hope to engage you as authors and readers, um, and so on. Uh, second, um, so here's another term I assume from social sciences that it's really important and relevant here, which is social capital. Mm -hmm. um, you all bring social capital here, but we also have these events and many more because we're trying to build social capital exactly in the way that, that Ken and Mary Ellen just charged you to go forth um, and continue these discussions. So part of that also means um, say hi to somebody you don't know, trade business cards, um, hang around for a few more minutes and talk. Um, and, uh, and, and we really are in the business of building, uh, building a knowledgeable community around these kinds of issues so that we can have an impact. Um, finally, just to reiterate, um, uh, thanks Mary Ellen, thanks Jed, thanks Toby, especially Ken, thanks to you for your hard work on this really visionary article and in, in inspiring this conversation. And finally, thanks to you all for coming. So see you next time.